My debut album, which was uh, The Dark and the Light, was actually meant to be a double EP. Um, <laughs> it's meant to be a double EP and the, the precursor to my debut album, which is coming out this year. Um, and it was meant to be two, two so that's why it was split into two, because it was my idea of having a double EP, one the light, one the dark. Um, and that, that was the initial idea that I came up with. And it eventually evolved into being one album with two separate discs um, and two separate cases that kind of slid together, creating this, this packaging masterpiece, um, which actually changed the title just in the packaging because once one slid into the other, um, Dark ended up being the first, the first light, the first on the line, and Light ended up being the second. So it was originally called The Light and the Dark, um, owed to uh, my more kind of optimistic view of life having the dark second and the light first, um, but it ended up being the dark and the light, um, the first album by a brother. The packaging took the kind of, the idea of the packaging started off simple and then went off on its own and, and kind of took over the whole concept to be honest. I think the, the packaging got, got a lot more attention in the, in the media when it came out than the actual album itself did. And I was happy with that because the whole point of the first release from Brotherman was to kind of put my name on, put my name and my face on the, on the map, you know what I mean, get me out there. And like the radio, radio loved the packaging and then they played the tracks, so it all kind of worked. And it had some, some amazing features on it. I mean, we had Coob's Session, um, we had TJ on Beats, we had Johnny Sims, First Man. Um, it was just, just an amazing collaboration with like, different people. Who all kind of like they all helped me to kind of formulate my sound because I was I was still a very young rapper at the time and hadn't kind of hadn't found myself and it was people like Kimo who made who helped me make Heart Them what it is because it really wasn't that when I took it to the studio and then it just became it evolved into into the track that it is which is one of, one of my biggest tracks to date and then you've got people like Johnny Simms who put in. 52 to sit to 68 hours of post-production on Hoodie with a Heart. So when I recorded it, it was your standard everyday hip-hop track. And then when he brought it back to me, it was fucking amazing. It was one of the best, like one, one is still one of my favorite tracks to date. And um, I think having these people help, and um, like tracks, tracks were recorded with people like um, Next, uh, Brad from Nextman. A lot of it was recorded with Jester um, at YNR. Um, studios and it, just things like that helped helped it become what it was and that's why it was such a strong product at the end of the day and I hope to further that with, with the next release. The, the, the beats and the, the, the hooks on, on the dark and the light were quite, were, were part of what, what made it what it is and I think that's, that's definitely a strong point in my music is the beat has to be the right beat and it doesn't have to be the most amazing beat it just has to be the beat that lends itself best to what it is that I'm trying to do when I get when I when I start writing and stuff I, I generally write a lot anyway just because I've got a lot that needs to come out and whenever I have an idea I write over whatever beat I'm listening to whether it be a track with another rapper um, rhyming over it or an instrumental by someone else or a lot of the time I listen to instrumental albums like, like Water for Chocolate and you know, I've got the instrumental album which I listen to and then it, it kind of like it inspires me to write and then I write I, I write these, these bars and I end up with, with masses and masses of 16 so sometimes I put those over a beat if I hear a beat that I'm like oh my god this would work really well with this so you know, I, I do it that way but at other times I get the beats first and then I think, what does what is this beat saying to me? What is the sample kind of making me feel? What do the sounds bring out of me? And then write that to to kind of write to the beat. But it doesn't to, for me. There's no kind of there's no clear protocol. I don't I don't have a set way of doing things. I, I kind of just go with it and make the most natural music that I can. If it sounds jarring, then I. I stop it and kind of like rethink the whole strategy but a lot of the time it just kind of it happens one way or another the track kind of just formulates and formulates and sometimes I can have uh, I'll have a beat for a year and won't have written to it 
sometimes I'll have a track for a year and won't have a beat for it. And it just it just depends on, on the day of the week, to be honest, in the way that I do it. That's, that would be a lie, so I never thought about writing beats. Because I have thought about it, but I've kind of, I've been lucky enough to find myself in a position where I've been constantly surrounded by people who are really, really, really talented at making beats. And therefore I found myself in the, some could, could, could consider it lazy, but I don't consider it that at all. I consider it as kind of leaving each person in the, in the formula to kind of do what they do best. I, I can't make beats at the moment. I could probably try my hand and make some all right beats and been listening to hip hop long enough and, and know enough about the production process to probably come up with, with, with an all right beat or quite a good beat. But I've got people around me who make amazing beats. And so I don't see there, there to be that much of a reason for me to actually take that time off of writing to learn the trade fully and I'm an all or nothing kind of person I would have to spend several years like digging in the crates and getting to know an NPC and getting to know all of the, 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 the techniques behind the production in order to make a beat that would be up to my standards but I could just phone up people like Mr. Thing and, and Harry Love and Jest and uh, Michael Parkinson making some sick beats, Jazz T's making beats, we've got Next Man, First Man, like Johnny Sims, TJ Session, Abba P, I've just got like the most like amazing wealth of really, really good dedicated beat makers around me and so I've never really found myself needing to actually to make beats myself. The, the musical palette displayed in my music is, is, is definitely more sophisticated than, than some, I wouldn't say most, but some. And I think that's an ode to to kind of the more kind of roots hip hop, like like root, the roots uh, common, uh, some talent quality stuff. It's like it's based again in my my upbringing. My upbringing was very musical. My dad taught himself to play Spanish classical guitar. I listened to, I, I listened to a lot of live jazz and went to a lot of live reggae concerts and bands, it's like saw bands for years and always loved the musical aspect of it. It was kind of almost too easy for me to just kind of put on a sample based instrumental that looped over and kind of rap over that. And I, once I started getting more and more into my music and into my into my music as brother man, I kind of wanted more of that musical sound in it. I wanted the, the, the tracks to be bigger. I always envisioned even instrumentals when, I, when I'd spit over them, I envisioned them being played by like a full band and having that full band behind me because I don't think there's any feeling. For me as a rapper, I've never felt as confident on stage as when I've got a full band of players behind me playing that same hip-hop music. It could be the exact same sound, it could be the exact same for my loop or whatever, but it's a live band playing it, it's live music and everyone's putting in and everyone's doing their bit. And there's just such a bigger feel about the music. So I think I've definitely tried to bring that through and I've definitely looked out for beats with more of a musical sound. And working with people like Coops um, in the past, he made an instrumental for me. I wrote over it, went back to him and then basically he had the whole instrumental replayed um, by live musicians in the studio. He had the strings played, he had the, the guitars and the, the keys, he had everything played separately and we made the same beat and that's why it had such a big sound. And I really love that. That big sound was it's, it's what I want out of hip hop. I want to, to bring people this big, fresh music that's not like, not samey and it's not like, it's not easy to kind of to, to, to brush aside. Well, my upbringing was split between um, Hackney and the Caribbean. I was born here, moved to the Caribbean, and then moved back when I was 10. Moved back to Hackney when I was 10, and there's definitely quite a contrast between the paradisal island that I lived on in the Caribbean and going to the beach after school every day and listening to reggae live all day, every day. street life of inner city happening, living in the States, kind of contrasted with the, the beach, the whites of the black sand beaches and what kind of guy that I grew up. And I think both have affected my music and my attitude towards that greatly. Um, I couldn't really 
really put finger on how, but it's just they, they have the music from the Caribbean and the music from that community from growing up in Hackney were both kind of infiltrated through. And so you hear me breaking out into a bit of a reggaeton every now and again in my music or singing or um, it can be heard through in the sound, not just in the lyrics. Yeah, I've got a new album in the pipeline coming up. It's um, still being worked on right now. It's called Too Late the Hero by Brother Men. And it's basically the, based on the concept that um, one could be a hero or classed as a hero, but could be too late to, to save the day effectively. And um, that's very much covered in the lead track, Too Late the Hero. Uh, the album should be out late this year, but I'm um, very prepared for it to be out early 2012. Um, but it's going to be a big release. It's definitely going to be what I personally consider to be my debut album. And uh, the album that comes out once, because I, I find myself in a place now where I think that I found myself. And I wasn't in that place when I grew out with Dark and Light. I was very much still working on stuff, and working on who Brother Man was, working on who I was as a person. But now I think that I'm on top of that. So this album should show it should, should be a good, a good, a good, a good example of who Brother Man is and what Brother Man sounds. I'm hoping to get features. Well, I'm getting features from people like Young Gun, Jest, Jaeger, Michael Parkinson. Um, hoping to get beats from Mr. Finn, um, Harry Love. So beat makers across the board, basically. It's, it's going to be a big release. Yeah, I don't have a date for it dropping. Don't don't really know who it's gonna come out for come out off. Hoping why not. Definitely in conjunction with why not anyway. And possibly off my own record in the country. I wanna set standards with, with the album. I've been hearing a lot of this um, kind of terms like grime and, and street and urban, they're making it big in the in the, in the commercial stay away from that but still be hip hop and still uh, I kind of want to take it back to the old school hip hop where hip hop was just like for being hip hop and it didn't have to be watered down, diluted and commercialised. It could still have the heavy message but the good music and the, the brilliant feel and still come through and be successful in the mainstream. Um, next for Brother Man I think is um, basically I'm working on my record label King and Country bringing a few eyes through like Stranger and um, hopefully working a lot closer with people like Eva Lazarus from uh, Brother Mafia. Um, we've got various rappers and singers on, on board but basically waiting to kind of waiting to groom them properly to they, to they come out and so they can all have decent releases off of what should be a decent platform in the country working on. It's basically the idea of Every each person being their own king and your own being your country, you know what I mean? None of this postcode lottery shit, none of this where are you from blood, like I'm from everywhere and so should you be, but I mean, it's a king king and country. So we're we're fighting for king and country and in that it's it's yourself and not queen and country. You know what I mean? So yeah, this has been um, Brother Man for Broken Culture, talking about hip hop, um, UK hip hop to be precise. Um, and before I go, I'd like to shout out YNR, YNR Affiliates, UK Stand Up, uh, King and Country, Scarlet Letter, and just anyone doing doing what you're doing to push this music forward. We need we need you. You know what I mean? Beat makers, producers, beat diggers, rappers, whatever you're doing, promoters. Just we we need to move this music forward, and that's what I hope that I'm doing. So in in, in light of that, I've been I've been brother man. This has been Broken Culture. You've been amazing. I'll see you later.